John chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 27. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. At this point, His disciples came and they were amazed. They had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, his disciples, the disciples, were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your inspired, infallible, inerrant word, life-giving word. We ask that the Holy Spirit would help us apply it as well as understand it. That we might glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a remarkable passage, as I'm sure you realize, and we've taken some time to walk through it, this being our third installment. John chapter 4 outlines Jesus here in his encounter with the woman of Samaria. And it's a contrast with chapter 3. And I think it's uh, significant that uh, chapter 3 comes and tells us of uh, Jesus' encounter with Nick at night. Nicodemus, who came at night to see Jesus. And the contrast is with this woman who came at noontime in the midst of the day. Big difference. He was an up and out. She was a down and out. He was the elite man in all Israel, if you think about it. In terms of religious status, he was on top of the mountain. He was the teacher of Israel, according to Jesus in John chapter 3. This woman, in contrast, was despised even by her own people who were themselves despised by the Jews. So there's the Jews, there's the despised Samaritans, and then beneath the Samaritans is this woman. So the top of the heap and the bottom of the heap are all contrasted within a chapter here. Jesus went out of his way as an assignment from the Father to have a conversation with a woman the woman of Samaria, who was, as I say, despised by her own people. And this encounter would result in an entire village being deeply impacted with many coming to Christ. One of the things we can glean from this, and there's many, many things, is the fact that Jesus initiated the conversation. A lot of times we as Christians are, are asking God for opportunities, but the only way we can think of a, that, that prayer being answered is someone coming to us and starting the conversation. Well, Jesus went out of his way, miles and miles out of his way, to find this woman and have this encounter. It was the exact opposite. Uh, I remember hearing of one man who was uh, praying for people to come and ask him about the Lord Jesus. He had a sound and thorough con uh, conversion, and he was asking God, Lord, would you open up conversations? And he, he was just beaming with the love of Jesus. He, he really loved people, but he was wanting them to come to him. And after about four years, literally in the office, one man actually came and said, you know, there's, there's something different about you. And he thought, 
thank God, four years of prayer is finally working. Yes, I can tell him about Jesus. And, he, and the man says, yeah, I, I just think there's, there's something different about you. Can you tell me, uh, what kind of aftershave do you use? <laughs> and all of his uh, emotion high went out the window there. But in initiating the conversation, Jesus gives us direction that it's more than okay to do so. And with this worldly woman who was very ignorant spiritually, she was occupied by the natural material world and its needs. Jesus steered the conversation in a certain direction. Starting with water, he began to point to himself as the solution for her lifelong quest. And at first it didn't seem like she was interested. He was talking spiritual things and she was deeply ingrained in the natural But he was using the natural to go over into the spiritual, from water to living water. And by the end of the conversation, Jesus had revealed profound truth to this woman. He had spoken to her of the nature and the location of true worship. Neither in this mountain, which was the Samaritan mountain, nor in Jerusalem will people be worshipping. But the Father is seeking those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. We camped out on that verse because it's just so good. And we might mention it on the way to what we're saying today. Worship is not about a location anymore, but the kind of encounter that we're to have with God. Worship is to be in spirit and in truth. Let me just say this. Worship is not a certain kind of experience that we should seek. It's something sought by God. God seeks true worshippers, according to John 4, 24, who worship in spirit and truth. I believe that's referring to passion and purity of devotion, that spirit. And the truth part refers to purity of doctrine. It refers to how we worship and who we worship. And the Father is seeking true worship. Many people after a service think, hey, that was a great worship service. I often think the Lord, if he could uh, speak and we could hear with with our ears, might say, uh, I'll be the judge of that. I'll be the judge of whether that was a great worship service. The Father is seeking those who worship in spirit and truth. We have this so wrong, so backward. We judge the worship experience by our preferences. I remember uh, just being shocked because it was a Christian radio host who was schooled for many years hosting a two-hour radio show who came to visit a church I was pastoring and uh, he said uh, hi John he knew me very well he said I'm just checking out your church and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of my wife but I won't be back and we won't be back I said why is that she, he said well I'm on a mission to find a church that has heavy metal music <laughs> I was just shocked because this wasn't just a little three-week-old Christian. This was someone who was schooled, apparently, in the things of God. And there are churches that you know of and I know of that have a particular style of music as the, the thing on show, a cowboy church. Well, what happens if you're from China? Cowboy, what that? You know, well, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do? Uh, 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 cowboy church, uh, 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 what's, what that? I don't know. You've got to be a cowboy to understand it and appreciate it. I think you're going to have a hard time in heaven because there may not be many cowboy services there. I just got that impression, you know. But we have our preferences. And, and, and well, John, don't you have yours? Yes, but what it matters is not my preferences or yours, but how God desires to be worshipped. And what I find in the scripture is, In spirit and truth, that's it. It doesn't say it's got to be according to a certain rhythm. It's got to be according to a certain wordage. And it's got to be this pace. You look at the Psalms and there's every kind of emotion expressed in the Psalms. There are some songs where if you're not depressed before you read that psalm, you might be afterwards. It, It takes you to the depths and then there you cry out to God. And I can't imagine singing that at a fast pace. My heart is lonesome. It it doesn't work. My heart is lonesome. It it doesn't, it it, it just doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to stop doing that kind of thing. I can, I can tell I'm on shaky ground. (laughs) 
But some people say, well, you know, uh, I prefer this. I understand. But I think one of the benefits and blessings I've had in my life is to travel quite a bit. I mean, when you've only got one sermon, you have to travel, right? And so I've traveled quite a bit. and I've been to India four times, Mongolia, Australia, New Zealand, and England. That's where I'm from, and Europe, and all of that. And it's given me the ability and the, the, the joy and privilege of worshiping with Christians who don't know my songs, and I don't know their songs, and I'm in their culture, and what do I do? Well, it's not the kind of music I'm used to. Let me say this, if it is true worship, it'll be true according to who God is and what the gospel is, and in my own way, I can sing those songs as heartily as I can sing them in my own preference style, because worship is not about my preference, it's about glorifying God. And if I was stuck in the first century, and you were, and we were at the, uh, the time in the book of Acts when they're worshipping God, if, if we could have a translation of uh, the words into English, we could sing along. We could sing along because it's not about the fact that it's of a certain style. It's in spirit and in truth. I just want to say that. So, according to God, we're to worship His way and do it His way. Whether there's an organ or no organ, guitar or no guitar. I feel sorry for churches that don't have this amazing machine. You know, I'm sure that's what it's going to be in heaven. It's just going to be a shock. The Apostle Paul gets up and says, we're all going to sing together. And he announces what the hymn or the song is. And then he stands on the front row and he presses a button. And, and uh, there we go. I'm sure that's the way it is, you know. But organ or no organ, guitar, no guitar. Really, can you show me that in the Bible? No, you can't, because God doesn't put worship on the terms of our preferences, but according to His statutes. <sighs> Revelation 5 says this, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they'll reign upon the earth. I can imagine, because I've got a fairly good imagination, an angel leading us in heavenly worship and saying something like this. The next song of worship is going to be led by all the redeemed from Venezuela. And they come to the front. And it's going to sound a lot different from uh, the Dutch and people from Finland or Mexico. Uh, if the people from Brazil or uh, you know, there's going to be thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Brazilians. I can't think of them rising up with the men in white shirts and dour black uh, ties and singing according to an English standard. I, I can't see that. It will, it will be praise to God with a, with a pep, with a rhythm. You can't walk around Brazil. I've walked around Brazil. You can't walk past houses without hearing the... Da, 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 and they go on for days doing this. They're crazy. <laughs> and they look at the English and say, no, no, you crazy, you crazy. You, 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 why no emotion? Because that's the way Jesus... No, it isn't the way Jesus. If you've ever seen some Israeli dancing, uh, I remember seeing a night of uh, Israeli dancing in England that this, this, these people were on tour. I was amazed at both the color and the sound. Spectacular colors and joyous sound. And so uh, I want to prepare you for heaven because it's going to be too much of a shock if you think, uh, they're not singing out of a hymn book. Uh, uh, is this heaven or is this the other place? <laughs> no, it's the right place. You're in the right place. Everyone's got a culture. But we're to get past it for the sake of God because God isn't English. Can you say amen? Yeah. <laughs> God isn't American. God isn't Brazilian. He's Lord of heaven and earth. Everyone's got a culture. None of it's wrong. It's style. It's preference. Jesus never said, the Father wants to be worshipped the English way. Praise the Lord. But in spirit and truth. Ken Hughes said this, Worship is not mindless activity. It includes mental interaction with the truth about God. What it means to worship in spirit and truth includes it being true what we're singing. We're singing of God and His attributes, the person and the work of Christ, the gospel of Christ. And Romans 12 says spiritual worship 
includes renewing the mind. It's not mindless activity. It's not a certain feeling. It's not coming out of an event saying, I felt something. That's nice if you did. But it's more important that God is worshipped truly. Now the way to the heart is the mind. Hebrews 8.10 has an interesting expression. God says, I will put my laws into their minds and I'll write them on their hearts. And I believe that's the way worship works. God puts the truth of himself into our minds and it filters down into our hearts. Talking of our emotions, our whole being. Can I sing this song? Well, yes. If your mind is engaged, your heart is inflamed, and if what you're singing is true, don't hold back. One of the things we put in our bulletin, you can look on the, the insert or the, uh, the inside of the bulletin there, says, here at King's Church, we stand in the tradition of reformation, faith, and practice. By the way, what I mean by that, when someone says, uh, I'm looking at reformed teaching or reformed theology, I just think, oh, biblical theology, biblical teaching. That's what it means to me. We believe true worship is biblically informed, unashamedly Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Spirit, centered on the person and work of Christ, and saturated in gospel truth. If it's that, I can sing it. I can sing that in a cowboy church, in a Brazilian church, in a Chinese church, anywhere, because it's the truth that matters, not my preference. Is that okay to say that? And it's too bad if it isn't. All right. <laughs> But oftentimes we um, don't do exactly that. We, we think my way is the right way. We see worship, as it goes on, as an act of offering sacrifice and praise to God. Our priority being to worship Him according to how He commands, not according to what may be popular in a particular culture in a particular time. If it's against your preference, but it's true, we should sing it. And if you can't, Repent and worship God. Otherwise, you know what you're doing? You're worshiping the music and not God. Now, what happens in this passage, Jesus said that's what the Father is seeking, true worship, in spirit and truth. And then he revealed to the woman that he was the long-awaited Messiah. That's staggering. If you read the rest of the Gospels, this is highly unusual that he says, uh, well, you're looking for the Messiah. I am. I'm the guy. I'm the Messiah. He did that. We saw that last time. Jesus, the Messiah, when we're in this uh, passage of John. Let's go to verse 27 where we began. At this point, it says, His disciples came and they were amazed that he'd been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? The disciples came back, they'd gone into town to get food, and they were amazed he was speaking with a woman, and more amazed it was this woman, and yet they didn't say anything. Rick Phillips writes, The disciples thought only in terms of the stifling show social conventions of their time and could not see the spiritual transformation taking place. They could not imagine a sinner becoming a saint. And they were particularly skeptical, skeptical about a Gentile being admitted into the company of God's people, especially a Gentile woman. They were surprised by grace, indeed dismayed or appalled by grace, to be more accurate. Their minds were fixed on the social status quo rather than the ground-shaking effects of Christ's coming. I think that's right. Now, the inference, I think, of this text, although it's not explicitly stated, is that they wanted to ask, but they didn't ask. They wanted to ask the question of Jesus, but they didn't voice that question. What do you seek? What are you doing, Jesus? Why are you speaking with her? They didn't say anything. I'm kind of glad they didn't. But religionists of all shapes, sizes, and forms are notorious. You ever seen this? For silent disapproval. They don't approve. They don't tell you. But they murmur behind the scenes. And they were about to do this till. God did what He did in this passage. I think that's what's going on. They don't like what's happening. Jesus has been about kingdom business while they were thinking they were on kingdom business. He was doing His Father's will. Look at verse 28. So the woman left her water pot. This week I've read a number of uh, sermons where great, uh, it's almost like trees have been uh, sacrificed, the amount of paper that's been written about what all of this meant 
this uh, water pot being left by the woman. And for some, it means that she left her old lifestyle behind. I, I don't know. What I think this means is that she left her water pot there. That's what I think it means. Well, doesn't it uh, have an analogy? It could, but it's highly speculative. What the text actually says is, she left her water pot. Well, I want some deep stuff. Well, I'm sure that water pot went deeply into the well, but that's how deep I go with this passage. We're not told why she left the water pot, but I think we can speculate. I think there are two possible reasons. Number one, she was in a hurry to tell others about Jesus, as we're going to see, that they found the Messiah and she had and wanted to tell others. Number two, she wanted, this is the other Option, she wanted to make sure Jesus got the water he needed. Scholars at the time believe, uh, scholars now believe that at the time the well would have been around a hundred feet deep, and that because Jesus needed water, the woman left him the necessary means so that after his exhausting journey he could get water. But I also think that both of those possibilities are true. She wanted to tell others, and she wanted Jesus to not go without the water he needed. But note her zeal for telling others. It goes on in verse 28. She left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. I always read this and smile because here was a woman known for being with men. And she was saying, hey, I found a man. Oh, oh, uh, again? All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Another one. All right. Come see a man. Now, it says here, he told me all the things that I've done. Now we know he didn't tell her everything she'd ever done. He didn't say at age seven, you did this. At age eight, you did this. He just mentioned one incident or really recountering her life story in one incident by the fact that she'd had five husbands. He hadn't told her everything, but this is hyperbole to say he knew everything. He could reveal anything he wanted, and that was clear. He revealed enough to her to know, for her to know, that her life was an open book before the Lord. And your and my life is an open book before the Lord. When we confess our sin to God, it's not when He finds out about it. It's when we're forgiven of it. He already knows everything. Do you remember that scripture in Hebrews 4 talking of the Word of God? It says, All things are laid open and bare before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. That's true. It's true about you. He knows everything. Your life is known to the Lord. It's laid bare. He sees all. And that's not a comfort to us, but He has precise uh, knowledge of our sin. That's why we need the Gospel. But it starts with the fact He knows it. And he can and does at times reveal it. Suddenly, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us. So she was going into the city. She says, come see a man who told me all the things that I've done. It goes on. This is not the Christ, is it? She was asking a question. Is this the Christ? Is he the one? I look at this and I think there's such wisdom here. If she'd run and said, I found the Messiah. What are the men likely to say? Well, she wasn't a rabbi, certainly of Jewish origin, and she certainly wasn't highly esteemed in the Samaritan community. I think they'd have said, yeah, right, and say, stop wasting our time. But in asking the question, you know what she was doing? She was giving the men the necessary respect to say, would you look into this? Uh, Could this be the one? Could this be the one? that is the Savior of the world, that is more than simply the Savior of Jews? And c- Could this be the one? Is this the Messiah? Would you, come, would you come and bring your knowledge to this? I know you know more than I. See the respect there? Uh, you know more. Would you come? Would you come and check this man out? Would you come and see? See, they knew her lifestyle. And she didn't cover this up. They knew what kind of woman she was because they'd lived in that community. Jesus, having not lived in that community, just arriving in the community, knew her life story. And so, 
Her sin was obvious now to her, but it did not stop her from speaking. I want to say this. Your sin does not stop you from telling others about Jesus. We're all sinners. There's, never, there's only ever been one person who's qualified to work for the Father, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us are unqualified and need grace and mercy. Oh God, don't give me justice, give me mercy. And God uses us in grace. And so when we're aware of that, we can speak of the saving power of God found in Jesus Christ because the message is not us. The message isn't my life change. I've had a change of life. Well, that's great. That's good evidence of the fact that it's true what you're saying. But you know, there's some people that have found peace in some very false kinds of religion. And they're... They're, they're not in right standing with God. And some people have had amazing experiences. And we can know from the scripture, they're not from God, but angels of light have come and deceived them. It's not about our experience. It's about what is true. And the fact that we're sinners is part of the message. I'm a sinner and I found a great savior. Wonderful. Who can come to King's Church? Uh, only sinners can apply. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who can come to the Lord's table? We say it each week. Only sinners, right? Absolutely. You can't say, I've had a sin-free week. I can come because I qualify for the Lord's table. I wouldn't try that. Don't try this at home or anywhere else. Don't do that. Now we come as sinners. And she, knowing her sin, still spoke of the Christ. Because Christ saved sinners. And she was concerned about other people's welfare. Now, this is what we would call invitational evangelism. There are some people who think the only way to talk about the gospel is to reveal all of it. And it's great that you do it. And I encourage that. But this is a spiritual baby. How many minutes old as a Christian? Do they know their way around the Bible yet? No, they, they, then it's not in their power perhaps to even articulate what the gospel is. But she knows if, they can, if she can get them to Jesus, they will hear the truth. And so she is on a mission to invite people to Jesus. Do you know, inviting people to church where they hear the gospel, giving people a track, giving them a book. You, you might say, well, it's a cop out. I could tell them the gospel. Yes, you could. But God can use anything. Rick Phillips, the man I'm quoting often, if, if you've gone through John's Gospel with me, he was converted because of the testimony of someone who was leaving an apartment near him as he was moving in. He was moving in, this lady was moving out, and she had some boxes, and he said, may I help carry these to the car? And for about three minutes he did so, maybe five or six boxes, and she, on the way out, getting in a car for the last time, driving out of that area, said, if you're ever interested in church, there's a good one on a certain avenue. It's called da 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 I can't remember what church it was. He did. Well, four months later, the Holy Spirit began stirring his heart. He realized he needed Jesus in some sense. He wasn't really able to articulate it. He went to the church that she recommended, heard the gospel and was saved. And he's the guy I'm quoting. Amazing. God can use anything. We just need to speak. I want to encourage you in that. Don't decry invitational evangelism. Don't despise it because look at this. A whole village was impacted by a woman who simply said, come and see. Come and see. She didn't rush in and say, you guys are all wrong. You said, this is the place to worship. I just met the Messiah and he told me that's not true. Salvation is of the Jews. She didn't go in with any of that. She didn't go in with guns blaring. Salvation is of the Jews. No, first things first. You know that saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing was that they come and hear Jesus. And she simply invited them to come hear Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. She didn't probably know how to articulate the word of God, but she knew Jesus would. So if she could get them to Jesus, her job would be done. Tracks are powerful. Sermons are powerful. Books are powerful. If they've got the Word of God in there. The great message of 
The gospel is come. Come to Christ. Jesus says, come, follow me. Come to me, all who are uh, laboring and are heavy burden, and I'll give you rest. I hope we too have concern for the lost. Do you have concern for your neighbor's spiritual well-being? C.H. Spurgeon said this, Have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. But what rises in the heart of a Christian is, I've heard this amazing good news. I must tell others. We sang in our service earlier, Amazing Grace. And the testimony of John Newton, who penned those words, is found in those uh, memorable words, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He understood the grace of God. He was a sinner needing Savior. His testimony is in the bulletin as a handout, and I encourage you to read that in your own time. But the point of all this is, you can do this. It doesn't take theological expertise to say, come and see. Come watch this with me. Read this, would you? Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. And a whole village impacted. Look at verse 30. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Whoa, that's exciting. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. They were now the ones fixated on the earthly. All of this kingdom activity happening and, hey, pass the pork and beans, although I don't think it was pork. Picture men coming. People are coming. People are coming to hear Jesus and the disciples seemingly were oblivious. Uh, Rabbi, it's, it's kind of food time. We've, we, we've, we've kind of just been out doing the kingdom thing, getting you food. Can you, can you just eat? Meanwhile, people are thronging to come to Jesus. Do you know you can be around Jesus and entirely miss what he's doing? These guys did. Jesus responds, verse 32, But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And they thought, well, has he hidden some food in his clothing? What, 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 what's going on here? So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Well, Jesus here was using food as an analogy. He often did this. Remember Matthew 4.4? 4, 4, same as Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He often used food as uh, an analogy, and that's because Jesus is the creator of food. He's the creator of everything. Colossians 1 tells us, do you know bread exists so Jesus, why does bread exist? So Jesus can show up and say, I'm the bread of life, and we know what he means. Why does water exist? Well, we need it. Yeah, but, but Jesus created water so that one day he could step into time and say, I'm the living water. I'm the water of life. Verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And again, he's moving from the natural to the spiritual. And he says, look, you want to talk about food? My food is to do God's will, the Father's will. He sent me and I'm about his mission. That's why he was there. He was on a mission. See, this is what excites Jesus. Doing the will of the Father. Seeing lives impacted. The spread of the gospel. He had no thought for earthly food, but heavenly at this point. Giving glory to God. Do you know you can do that? I trust that's true of you, that your food is to do the will of God, to give glory to God by your life and by your witness. That does not mean we're all called to be gospel preachers. I believe someone can be a road sweeper. It was pounded into me. Son, if you're going to be a road sweeper, sweep the road. Don't be telling people about Jesus if you're not sweeping the road. And if you're a sweeping the road, make sure that your road is the cleanest road in the city. Well, how's that glorifying God? That is glorifying God. That's what you're assigned to do by your employer. Give glory to God by the work that you do. Amen. The most in our society are self-absorbed. You ever met someone who's self-absorbed? No. Self-centered people. Have you found this out? They're the most depressed of people. We live for the glory of God. 
And you realize your joy is seeing others impacted by the Lord Jesus. That was a great day. Why? What's a great day for you? Being self-absorbed, having all the entertainment. I watched seven movies today. What a great day. Oh, really? Or is a greater day. I got to tell someone about Jesus. I got to tell someone about Jesus. What's your food? What's food for you? At the end of the day, I know you're tired. What, what, what would you love? When, when someone you haven't heard of in three years, you get on the phone, you're able to tell them just in a short way about the Lord Jesus and what he's doing in your life. That, that's a great day. See, God uses unlikely people. This Samaritan was an unlikely candidate to be an evangelist when the day started. Humanly speaking, she was a notorious woman. You don't train those kind of people to be evangelists. But Jesus, he'll, he'll use them for his glory. You know, God used this notorious woman to impact an entire village who was speaking of a Jewish teacher. Imagine a woman, not just a woman, a notorious woman, going to Samaritan men and saying, I've met an amazing Jew. Try that. that that's not the way you're going to get a great phone. But the Holy Spirit was at work and lives were impacted. I've learned this. God can do a lot with a little and he can do everything with nothing. <laughs> And the little we are in our own eyes, the more God can use us because we're realizing it's not me and my power that's making this happen. But the person who thinks, I've got this amazing ability, look, watch me. Hey, this is a job for Superman or Super Christian. And that's me. And God says, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the humble so that when I really use them, they're able to to re deflect and say all oh, glory to God rather than, yes, yeah, so of course, that's my, that's my gift. Be nothing in your own eyes. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Verse 35, do you not say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Now the background here is that the people of that time suddenly knew about harvesting of crops they knew what season they were in. They could tell when a particular harvest was coming. They knew it was eight months away, six months away, here, four months away, two months away. They knew that. And Jesus is not saying, don't say that. He says, do you not say? In other words, you understand this. You understand that it's four months until harvest time. But that's not what's happening here. Naturally speaking, it may be four months until harvest time, but that's not what's happening here. Right before your eyes, this is harvest time. That's what's going on. Look up. Now is harvest time. The fields are white. Do you see that in the text? The fields are white. Now, with crops, I'm told that when the crop is white, when it's of a certain type, it's not just simply ready to be harvested. It's actually to the point where if it's not harvested right now, the whole crop is going to go to waste. There's an urgency. It's not just ripe, it's white. It's beyond ripe. It's at this point where if you don't gather it now, the whole thing's going to be lost. And so there's this urgency. Come on, let's get out there. Bring your trucks, bring your wheelbarrows, bring some containers. We've got to get the harvest in now. Now is the time. Now is the time of the harvest. There's an urgency. A lot of people speculate as Christians. Is this the last generation? Well, in a sense, that's not really the right question because we've only got this generation to reach this generation. Death is the grim reaper. He's at work in the valley throughout the world. Hundreds of thousands will lose their lives this week around the world. We don't know who they are. And that's why we need to understand it's appointed for men to die once and after this comes the judgment. That's what Scripture says. Hebrews 9.27 And an unpreached gospel doesn't help anybody. News may be news. And it may be good news. But good news that is not heard can't affect anybody. Good news must be heralded. 
Now is the day of salvation. Now. See, people's eternal welfare is on the line. The big picture here is Jesus is saying the harvest is so big we need everybody involved. Do you remember he said in Matthew 9, 37, the harvest is, well, there's a little, no, plentiful. But the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You and I don't know who the elect are, but we're to be about the Father's business knowing it's harvest time. And God has made me to be me with my height, with my weight, with my accent. God, this is me. This is who I am. You've got no one else to work with. God will never say, you know, if you were more like Billy Graham, I could have used you. No, he made Billy, Billy, and he made you, you, you be you. And there's a lot of people that may never have sat to listen to the evangelist on the television, but they'll listen to you. They'll see a life lived in front of them, and they'll hear words from your mouth. And God will use you. This is what Jesus says. Behold, as we read the text, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Not just ripe, white. Let me say this to you. Look up, Christian. Can you see the harvest at your school, at your college, at your university, at your workplace, in your network of relationships? Look up, verse 36. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I believe what this is talking about in this context is to ask this question, who sowed into this Samaritan outreach? If you think of this as an outreach, Jesus goes to Samaria, encounters a woman, the woman is impacted, goes tell the men, the men come to Jesus, the whole town affected. Who sowed? Well, the father in sending the son, right? The father sent the son into the world. The son... In going to this place, he could have stayed where he was, but he went. I think Moses involved because the five books of Moses were known to the Samaritans. So Moses had uh, inadvertently sowed into the Samaritans. John the Baptist had preached nearby. We see that from the previous chapter. John chapter 3 verse 23, very, very nearby town. John had preached there. And then the woman. So there's the father, there's the son, there's Moses, there's John the Baptist, and there's the woman who's now telling others of Christ. Years later, in Acts chapter 8, we'll read of Philip the deacon who'll come to Samaria and bring many to Christ. Perhaps many who heard or heard stories of Jesus who had come to that village. In contrast, the disciples had done nothing. And so Jesus is making the point. Others have sowed, you're reaping. But before there's any reaping, there's first the sowing. Our task is to sow. We're not responsible for the outcome, thank God. We're responsible for sowing. And Christ is powerful to save. And the sword that pierces the heart is the Word of God. Not your great speaking ability. Not your great... Ability to articulate. You might say, but I, I can't speak very well. But can you, can you learn one of two, three, four, five scriptures? Can you share the Word of God? It's the Word of God that penetrates. And you may be squeaking it out. You may have a cold. You may even have the flu. And be on the phone and say, for God so love the world. And someone's impacted. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's Christ who saves And it's the Word of God that penetrates the heart. I know the more I can fill my heart and mind with the Word of God and know it, and know it in context, I'll have a sharper uh, gifting in God. It's up to me to sharpen the tool God gave me. And that's by studying. But the more I put the Word of God in my heart and mind, the more I can be used by God. And so with you. But learn something. Learn something. Or at least say, come and see. Praise the Lord. The woman just simply got people to the right person and the right place, and Jesus did the rest. Look at verse 38. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. That's the disciples. Others have labored. We've talked about who those 
were, and you have entered into their labor. Hmm. Do you know your mouth is a pulpit? Your written words, maybe in an email, on the internet, are a pulpit. God can use you. Verse 39, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. Wow. Two days of teaching, two days of Q&A. Hey, ask any question. Jesus is there. And what was the result? Verse 41, many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. I want you to be encouraged in your evangelism. I want you to be encouraged if you have a heart to reach others because God has reached you. Understand, they came, they saw, they heard for themselves. And then many more believed because a woman said, Three words, come and see, come and see. What about you? Have you come? Have you seen? Taste and see that the Lord is good, the Bible says. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Have you come to Christ? Have you turned from sin? Are you... Able to say, I've encountered Christ like this woman has. Through the scriptures, I've understood He is the Messiah. He's the one who's been sent into the world. And what was the message? There was one who would come, who would strike and destroy the serpent who'd ruled in the hearts of men. This one who was the promised seed, the Messiah, who'd be born of a virgin, who'd live a sinless life, never once having to say sorry to either people or the Father. Sorry for that. No, never had to. He always did what was pleasing to God. At the baptism of Jesus, the Father made that known. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Don't think He's being baptized for His sins. He has no sins. Something else is going on. He's fulfilling all righteousness. He lived this righteous life. And then on the cross, He became the substitute for sinners. As sin was laid on Him. Imputed, counted to his account, like a wire transfer. All the sins of all the people who would ever believe, placed on the Lamb of God on the cross. And he bore their infirmities. He carried their iniquities in himself. And the punishment due to us was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed, the Bible says. It was all substitution. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24 There on the cross, can you see him? He died for sinners. He died the death you and I deserved. He was buried to prove he died. Three days later, he rose from the dead because the Father said, that's it. I'm satisfied. You have achieved the mission. I'm raising you up. And God gave him the title of Lord. Had that name. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One day, every knee will be made to acknowledge His Lordship. Some in judgment because they have not come under His Lordship. But for others, we have the opportunity to come under that Lordship now. Having seen who He is, come to Christ, repent, turn and be impacted like this woman. And then it will be the most natural thing. She was not doing this to try and get an encounter with Jesus. She had the encounter with Jesus and just had to tell the great story. We don't do things to get God's favor. She had God's favor. It's by grace we're saved, through faith, that not of yourselves. Salvation is a gift. And the things we do is a response to the fact that we're in gratitude. Lord, thank you for saving me. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is and what he's done in human history. He came to the big cities, but he also came to the little village places. And we can't hide from you. You know us intimately like this woman found out, this unnamed woman. 
Lord, you know us and you know our name. You know how many hairs are on our head. We're intricately known by you. And I pray, Lord, that in exposing our sin, you'd also reveal the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God to each one here. That they would know you and encounter you and know eternal life because they believe in Christ, the Savior and Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.